it was amazing how many new comedians emerged during this decade of the Great Depression. Most of us, of course, can't remember that. But people who were able to give the gift of laughter in dark times were precious and celebrated, just as they are now. Laughter in the face of discouraging circumstances reminds us of the deeper goodness that lies underneath. And that's why I found myself appreciating and on occasion even posting to Facebook some of the both serious and silly things that I've seen recently. And it's to help me and to help you tap into that underlying joy. So here's a little bit of the silliness I saw some of the, uh, this week. Some of it was from, from you guys that made me chuckle a, a bit. Uh, this one was good from uh, The Sound of Music. <laughs> the hills are not alive. The hills are closed. <laughs> um, and this one's from Groundhog Day, <laughs> which it feels like that a little bit, doesn't it? It's quarantine day again. We're going to redo this all over again. Uh, you notice that I like these from movies from The Princess Bride. Quarantine. <laughs> quarantine is what brings us together today. And no, I'm not making fun of speech impediments. I just love that movie. And uh, one of you posts this one because we're in an era now of face masks. And uh, what the different face masks say about a person. And I was particularly fond of this, the bottom from where you can't corner there. Uh, <laughs> the person who shouldn't be allowed out of the house. Uh, fortunately, I haven't sunk quite to that level yet. Well, in our times with you here, thank you so much for tuning in and doing church this way. We've been doing more of our serious stuff, despite the silliness with which we must sometimes begin a message. We've been trying to remind you of what really matters. No matter what's going on in the world, and there's an awful lot going on in the world. On Easter Sunday, two weeks ago, we rejoiced with our friend Jesus, like the early disciples did, that he had risen from the dead. Yeah. And last week, we told you how his resurrection has changed everything for us, even though we aren't always aware of it, even though we don't always remember how radically transformed we really are. And that's when the joy comes in, when we find out that as he was changed, so are we. His early friends, there's those stories, the ones recorded in the scripture, they illustrate this transformation. And we'll see that in the coming weeks. But it really matters for us, always. But especially right now, doesn't it? What he has already done for us and in us is exactly what we need for such times. And exactly what we have to offer the rest of the world that's a little lost and confused right now. Yeah, and if what we have to offer is transformation through Christ's resurrection. Let's first notice something about the nature of that transformation. First, it's an ongoing process. So, as we know, Jesus' resurrection happened quickly. He was placed in his tomb on Friday evening and he walked out of it on Sunday morning. His transformation happened over the course of three days. But our transformation takes a little longer. It happens over the course of a lifetime. When we first give our lives to Christ in faith, we're united with him and become one spirit with him. That's what the scriptures say over and over again. And Paul tells the Corinthians that. And then he tells the Ephesians, we become new creations. And we looked at that last week. But it takes time for that spiritual transformation, that spiritual union within to work out in all of the other aspects of, of our being and of our lives. Paul describes this ongoing process this way. He says, and we all who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. See, the idea that he's getting at here is that over time, as Jesus' ongoing transformation process outworks on the inside, it can be seen on the outside more and more and more kind of in shades of ever increasing glory. Mm. You think of it like a dimmer switch. Um, as this process of transformation continues inside of us, the very presence, the very image, the very, the glory, the tangible presence of Christ can be seen shining through our lives in ever increasing intensity, ever increasing brightness. It's like you go over to the wall with the slider of um, the dimmer switch and you just ever so slowly just push it up, up, up. That's the idea here. 
we just continue in ever increasing intensity until at some time in the future, even our physical bodies are going to be clothed with immortality, are going to shine um, and be transformed like Jesus was. But this, trans this process, well, it's not automatic. It's, it requires something, something of us. And that's because Jesus' transformation is also an yeah. indwelling partnership. He is in us, and we are in him, living life together. You know, when I was younger, I imagined my, my faith as something I had to do on my own. Uh, God was waiting for me or looking for me to get my act together. And what good news. Good news means gospel. Gospel, to discover what was true all along. That the Spirit of Christ is in me, doing life through me, in partnership with my own will and my own desires. And yeah. together as active partners, we cooperate together to change me from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So that I am increasingly transformed into the character of Christ. Right. And then through that changed identity, through that shared union with Christ, the transformation process then unfolds. It becomes an unfolding purpose. There are so many Christians today who believe that once they have a personal relationship with God through, through Christ, and once they discover their individual gifts and callings, and then they go and do those things, that they've arrived, that, wow, I've come to the fullness of God's purpose in creating me. And I want to say, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> All of that personal reality about me and Jesus, you and Jesus, individual callings, individual gifts, all of that personal reality is true. You're not going to get any, any argument from me there. But there is so much more. Because each person's individual God-given purpose is simply one strand of the fabric of the eternal purposes that God is outworking in the whole world, the whole creation through all time and history. And so what is then, what is this purpose that God is unfolding, not only in you and me, but in all of us? Well, again, we keep going back to Paul, but Paul clearly said that what the purpose is this is what God planned for the climax of all times. To bring all things together in Christ, the things in heaven, along with the things on earth. See, that's what's been happening ever since the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, ever since he started to unfold this, his purposes in this ongoing process. It's the process of reconciliation, the reconciliation of all things as one in Christ, as God originally intended. And that's good news. But there's, again, like Tony was saying, gospel, good news that every one of us matters in God's unfolding purpose. We matter both individually and especially together as the church. And this is good news. It's good stuff. But what does this look like practically in the real world of mm -hmm. unemployment and fear and isolation? Division, social distancing, sheltering in place, all those words that we're using now that we never used before and the experiences we're having now that we've never had it before. Over the next few weeks, we're going to flesh this out in a variety of ways, but today we're going to notice that Jesus comforts. Yes. Now, a number of us are going to just nod our heads in agreement with this. This is the Jesus we have met. This is the Jesus we encounter in Scripture. But, you know, some others might struggle a bit. And if you're responding to that, you, you're not alone here because somewhere along the way, we've been given a different image. And this is a wonderful opportunity to change that image. This is good news because Jesus had been comforting people throughout his whole life. Yeah. And it's really no surprise that after his resurrection, he does the same thing. That's who he was. That's who he still is. But now, because of the resurrection, his friends are able to receive and respond to his comfort differently than ever before. Yeah. And we are his friends. He began with those first friends, those early friends, as he does with all of us, by meeting them exactly where they were. So where were they emotionally and spiritually in the days and weeks after the resurrection? Well, as we've been trying to point out, in many ways, they are right where we are right now. They were living in confusion and ambiguity, experiencing what felt sometimes like opposite things at the same time. 
Yep. It was simultaneously experiencing a great trauma. They watched their friend die yep. and also great grace. They felt both grief and joy. And they had lost and then they have found, but they haven't reconciled these emotions yet. This is all raw and new. Right. They knew both fear and peace, which sounds contradictory unless you've been there and you know what that feels like. Right. And we'll see in the stories, they express both doubt and hope. And um, I'm just curious, any of that sound familiar? It does to me. <laughs> does to me. <laughs> so each week in this series that we're starting today, we're going to be exploring some biblical accounts of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. And as we do, we're going to be watching as Jesus joins his disciples where they are and then invites them into the transformation process so that they can join him where he is. And because everything happened so quickly, he gave them time to adjust. He just stayed for 40 days to, experience, to allow them to experience some healing of their past pain so that they would be able to welcome the future hope. So this week, as we notice this first part, of Jesus' transformation process. We'll look at the beautiful story of Jesus comforting his dear friend, Mary Magdalene, as she wept outside his empty tomb, beside herself with grief. Let's read the um, account from John's Gospel. Mary arrived back at the tomb, broken and sobbing. She stopped to peer inside, and through her tears, she saw two angels in dazzling white robes sitting where Jesus' body had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. Dear woman, why are you crying, they asked. Mary answered, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And then she turned around to leave, and there was Jesus standing in front of her, but she didn't realize that it was him. He said to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Mary answered, thinking he was only the gardener. Sir, if you've taken his body somewhere else, tell me, and I'll go and marry. Jesus interrupted her. Turning her to face him, she said, Rabboni, Aramaic for my teacher. And Jesus cautioned her, Mary, don't hold on to me now, for I haven't yet ascended to, my, to God, my father. And he's not only my father in God, but now he's your father and your God. Now go to my brothers and tell them what I've told you, that I am ascending to my father, to your father, to my God and your God. Then Mary Magdalene left to inform the disciples of her encounter with Jesus. I have seen the Lord, she told them. And she gave them his message. Well, that's the story. Let's unpack this a little bit and maybe see a little bit of Mary Magdalene in ourselves. What was it like to be Mary that weekend? Well, maybe the best word for it is to say that she was adrift. She was disoriented, confused, traumatized. The anchor of her life had been pulled up, and, and now she's without anything solid to hold on to. Yep. Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> a little discombobulated? Maybe not just externally, because the world has abruptly changed around you, but internally as well. Perhaps a feeling that you've lost all meaning in life, that you don't even know who you are anymore, or what is real. I suspect we all get there from time to time, and I suspect there's a lot of people there right now. Yeah. You know, that's Mary. She had given up everything to follow Jesus into the kingdom that she thought he would establish on earth. And now she had not only lost that dream, but she had lost her beloved friend. Yeah. But here's the cool part. Her friend knew that. Yeah. He had felt that pain and loss himself. So let's ask the follow-up question. What was it like to be Jesus that weekend? <laughs> he had felt abandoned by his friends precisely when he needed them most. And there on the cross, he had felt forsaken by his father and the one he was most intimate with in the universe. And he felt those things while enduring the unspeakable trauma of the, of the cross with its physical torture. Yeah. He really did understand how Mary felt. And he really does understand how we feel. 
The yeah. Bible even reminds us of this. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And don't think here just of moral failings or whatever. He didn't lose himself. He didn't lose his trust in the Father in the midst of his pain and bewilderment. Yeah. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there we will receive his mercy, particularly when we're discombobulated. <laughs> and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. And many of us here who are participating in this, listening to this, know that experience. We've been there. We've done that. Mm -hmm. We know that we have in Jesus a high priest who's experienced everything that we have and who understands yep. and is therefore able to help us in ways that no one else ever can. Yeah. And so, and we see him doing that with Mary, don't we? We look at how did Jesus comfort her? Well, first, he's present. He's present with her. He came to her where she was, as she was. She didn't have to clean up her act. She didn't have to pull it all together in order to be okay for him. No, he came to her just as she was and created a safe atmosphere for her. She had just seen shining angels in the tomb and that <laughs> overwhelmed her. The, you know, it's just like, it's too much. And so, she, she turns and, and Jesus, you can almost see him saying, you know what, <laughs> this, I'm not going to shock her anymore by revealing myself in all of my spectacular risen glory. I'm not going to go, ta-da, and scare her to death. <laughs> <laughs> he gradually reveals himself to her, first as a gardener, as someone <laughs> who will patiently tend her broken, her broken heart. Jesus is empathetic. He's gentle. And he, he picks up the conversation where the angels left off. They said, dear woman, why are you crying? And he says, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And then he compassionately listens as her grief and her confusion and, and her pain just gush out and his focus remains on her the whole time he just listens until she's calm enough to actually be able to hear him you know are you getting some sense of how comforting jesus safe listening presence was for mary especially since others especially in her culture might have watched what she was doing doing and just judged her to be crazy but Jesus doesn't condemn her. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you, Mary? Rather, Jesus comforts her. In essence, what he's saying is, what happened to you, Mary? Tell me all about it. And he is safe and soothing and very, very present as she does that. And he is very, very personal. Mm -hmm. Mary, he says her name. No doubt in the way that she had heard countless times before. And that's when she recognizes him. He had said that, by the way. That's how you could tell it was him. He doesn't lecture her. He doesn't teach her the metaphysics of resurrection. He doesn't appeal to her head at all at this point. That's not what she needs. Instead, he gives his adrift, drowning friend a lifeline. He gives her a solid place to stand in the shifting sea of emotion. And what he said in that simple name and the few words that were exchanged was that although everything has changed, some things are unchanging. Yep. And that he and she are still connected in love. That you, Mary, still matter to me. Even though the way that they relate is going to change. Yeah, so as Jesus comforts, he's present and he's personal and he's promising. He Mary responds to recognizing Jesus the same way that any, any of us would, I think. If our closest friend, you know, this beloved person in our life was dead, and then suddenly they're standing in front of us alive, I think we would all do what she did. Grab him. <laughs> just, she embraces him. It's just kind of an instinct, isn't it? And again, see, he's not condemning her. He comforts her again. He, he gent he's gently anchoring 
her in their new reality. He's saying, he says, Mary, don't hold on to me in this way anymore because our relationship has changed and it's changing. But here's the good news. We're never going to be separated again. And I know, I mean, this is like Joanne paraphrase, but it's like he's saying with all of this, I know your head can't grasp this yet, but let your heart not be troubled. Our relationship is in the process of becoming far deeper than you can ever imagine because it's no longer just you and me. My father is now your father and you're his daughter. See, Jesus comforts by giving her hope. He gives her the promise that no matter how it may seem now, things are changing for the better. And the same is true for us, even in this anxious time that we're living in now. Jesus comforts us with that same hope and that same promise. He's saying, don't cling. So here's something real practical. Let's not cling to what was. Let's not cling to the past. Even what was most enjoyable and meaningful to us from the past. There are things that remain unchanging, like Tony said. But there are other things that God says, you know, there, I have more for you. So let's hold on to what matters in every given moment. And when he says, let go of something, then that's the invitation to hold on instead to a hope-filled promise that one day, not too long from now, we're going to understand more clearly the purpose that God is unfolding in our lives right now. We can't see it now. She couldn't see it then. But in time, oh my word, to let go of what he asks us to let go of allows our hands to be open to receive the more that he has for us. And then Jesus goes on and he comforts Mary some more, as if that all isn't enough. He then, he gives her something to do now that'll allow her to share in that hope. He tells her to do something that no woman would ever have been asked to do before that. He says, yeah, go bring this message of my resurrection and my ascension to my brothers. And what's fun is um, that's the first time that Jesus calls the, the male disciples brothers. And so Mary did. She went and she told them, I have seen the Lord. And listen, as an eyewitness to the risen Christ sent by him with a message for the disciples, Mary Magdalene became the first apostle. She became living proof that Jesus' process of transformation was already unfolding and that it wasn't only for him, that it was for her and it was for all of us. So Mary comforts, Jesus comforts Mary in a way that is present to her and personal to her and promising to her. And what did she do in response? She didn't recite a creed. She didn't even stop like the first Mary and pondered these things in her, in her heart. There's a time for all of that, of course. But in that moment, all this was too unexpected and too wonderful. And so she responded instinctively with exuberant joy. And then she participated as best she could in the intensity of that moment in what God was up to. And her response, of course, can be our response too. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ponder the theological implications of a global pandemic? Sure. I have a number of students who are doing that right now. <laughs> Do you want to predict how the world will be after all of this? Go for it. But in that pondering and predicting, do not lose sight of the most important thing. Jesus is alive still. And our exuberant joy about that, our participation with him, is a transformed way of relating to God yeah. and to others. And yes, even to ourselves, everything has changed for us. Yes. And now with Christ in us, we too can be like Jesus, present with each other, personal with each other, and promising to each other. And this isn't just theory. This world is adrift like Mary. And we need to keep our faith very real and very practical for life right now. The world needs us. So here are a few brief suggestions for how we can live this out in our own life. The first one is 
let's honor everyone. That's our theme for the year. I told you last week, we haven't forgotten that. It's been underneath the surface, but it really, really matters right now. Honor everyone, especially when they are disoriented, distraught, or disagreeable, discombobulated even. <laughs> Honor everyone, even when they disagree with your perspective on things, the politics, the economy, the pandemic. Honor everyone, even when they're wrong. Yes. <laughs> Let's show this troubled world authentic respect of the way that Jesus shows us. Yep. Let's be like Jesus was with Mary. Yes. And as we honor everyone, let's also comfort everyone. Let's not harshly condemn those who look crazy to us. Let's not harshly demand, what's wrong with you? You know, rather, can we be a safe place for others to share their confusion and their fear and their frustration and their pain? Can we listen like Jesus did? Can we listen to them for as long as they need us to so that they might calm down enough to be able to listen and listen not to us, it's not about us trying to talk somebody down so that they'll hear us. That is not the point. Mm -hmm. For us to listen to them compassionately, to comfort them long enough for them to be able to come down and be able to listen to Jesus calling their names. Let's offer Christ's compassion. Let's offer Christ's hope and promise. And not only with words, which can be spectacularly meaningless at times like this. Mm -hmm. Words just, they fly by, just like they were with Mary, with any traumatized person, with any people who are in this state of being so adrift. No, it can, the words can end up being meaningless. What we offer is not only words, sometimes yes, but let's offer what we have actually received. God's comfort. We offer what we have already been given by God. 2 Corinthians 1.4, he comforts us in all our affliction. Why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction. Yeah, let's comfort everyone and honor everyone. Yeah, yeah. let's include everyone in that comfort. Because yep. everybody is invited. Jesus made it clear. Everybody's invited to this participation and this new creation, this new thing that he's up to. Even Peter, who had denied him. We'll get to that story in a, a little later. And, um, and the women, too. As Joanne said, if the male disciples are his brothers and the female disciples are his sisters, they're all family of the same father. And we're going to see in the coming weeks that the group of Jesus' disciples, friends, brothers, and sisters is going to expand to include far more than they had ever imagined. So let's do the same in our own perspective, in our own heart. Let's invite the whole broken world into this marvelous kingdom that God is creating through Jesus. Yeah, those, yes, Hosanna. Let's invite them all into the marvelous kingdom. Yeah. And some of you may be thinking right now, okay, sounds good. How is it possible? How can I be that kind of honoring, comforting, including person when I'm struggling to maintain my own balance in the world right now? Well, there's good news for all of us who feel adrift like Mary was at the beginning of this story. When we're adrift, we can be anchored. And what is that anchor? Hope that the economy is gonna rebound soon. Is that our anchor? Oh, I know what it is. Tony, I know what it is. Our anchor is confidence in doctors and political leaders, right? Yes. Oh, never leave. <laughs> <laughs> what about bravado that, oh no, I'm not going to fear the virus. It won't affect me. <laughs> no, we have a better, stronger, more permanent anchor than any of that. We have Jesus. And Jesus is inviting us to transformation precisely in this moment when we don't have a clue what's going on. Mm, and we don't. But we too can participate. In the most fundamental, life-transforming way possible, we can choose to trust Jesus. Yeah. In ever-increasing ways. And this is the core, this is the ongoing imitation of our spiritual lives. It's what the word faith really means. 
Yeah. But here, more good news. It's not all up to us. This isn't like scrunch up your your face or flip a, a flip a switch and suddenly you you start trusting. Even this is done in partnership with the Spirit who dwells within us. Yep. But I tell you, when we begin to trust in a love that is so deeply personal and so powerfully healing, it's the love of Christ. We do find it possible to stop clinging to the past. We do find it possible to surrender to that love, as we've been talking about in recent weeks. And then we can even trust what we do not understand. And much of everything that is going on now, we do not understand. We can trust that over time, it will make sense. Yep. Or even if it doesn't, yep. we can trust the ongoing process. We can trust that indwelling partnership. We can trust that enfolding purpose that we, we noted at the beginning of this message which means we can also trust the invitation to take the next step. Even if it's just one step and we can't see where the journey is going to lead and we can't see any further than just the one step to take the one step and trust that Christ is there in us, with us, for us. Yeah. Trusting that just the next step forward when we can't see or control the whole journey, that's transformational faith. That's what we get to do. Yes. And it changes everything. Yeah. So... That's all true, but we want to close our time together by inviting you to allow this, this truth to speak, you know, not only to your heads, but also to your hearts and to your spirits and to your lives. We want to invite you to allow the living word, both the living word of scripture and the living word of Jesus himself to become as real for you as he was for Mary Magdalene. So what we wanna do is, um, I'm, I'm gonna lead you through just a simple biblical prayer reflection based on John 20, 11 through 18, the story that we've been talking about of Mary Magdalene and Jesus outside his tomb. And we've done this before um, in this online format. And, um, one of the beauties of having this recorded is that you can stay with us now if you're ready to just pray right through, or you can pause the recording and you can come back and pick it up and pray later. Um, whatever seems right to you. So as we prepare to pray, why don't we just close our eyes and get still inside as we ask the Holy Spirit to make this scripture story come alive for us. And I'm going to pray, Lord, please allow your word to be alive and active now for each one of us. And please reveal yourself through it in ways that are most personal, most comforting for each one of us. And we thank you because we trust that you will do that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now with your eyes still closed, in your godly imagination, begin to see the scene at Jesus' tomb. Just start to take it in. What do you, is the sun shining? Can you feel the breeze on your face? I mean, what are you hearing? It's morning, are there birds? And now focus on Mary, who's just distraught with grief as you watch her weeping. What do you feel? What do you feel as you watch her? Now see Mary bend down to look into the tomb. That dark opening suddenly shines with bright light. From inside the tomb, you hear a voice. Why are you crying? Mary weeps into the doorway. They've taken my Lord away. I don't know where he is. And you see just how afraid she is. You see just how confused she is. Now, pause, notice. Are there ways in which you're afraid or confused right now? Do you feel adrift in a sea of uncertainty? 
What's weeping inside you? Take a moment to be aware of how your experience is resonating with Mary's experience. Take the time you need. And feel free to pause anywhere along the way. Pause the recording. And when you're ready, pray something like this. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm confused, afraid, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated. Just tell him whatever it is, just how you are. And sometimes I don't see you, Lord, but, but I want to know where you are in the midst of the challenges that I'm facing every day. I don't need spectacular angels. I just need you. Please reveal yourself to me. And now you turn your attention back to Mary. She turns to run away from the tomb, but someone's standing in front of her. He asks her tenderly, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she doesn't seem to recognize who it is. She just keeps her head down and she continues to pour out her pain. And she's asking this man over and over again to tell her, where is Jesus' body? I just want to go get him. I just want, I just need to know where he is. As you watch her, what do you notice in yourself? Have you ever been or are you now that desperate to be in control of the circumstances of your life? Do you feel any of that desire to just have control over something right now? Or have you ever been so disoriented, you just need something tangible to anchor you in reality? Or maybe you're feeling something else but whatever it is, take a moment to be aware of this. Take a moment to be aware of what in Mary's experience is speaking to your own experience. And again, take as much time as you need. But when you're ready, pray something like this. Lord, I feel out of control. I don't understand what's happening, and it's hard not to know where this is going and what the outcome will be. I sometimes find it difficult to believe you're really with me. Please, I need your comfort. I need to sense somehow that you're still with me even when I can't feel it. Thank you for being the patient gardener of my soul who listens to me with such compassion and love. And now again, turn your attention back this time. Watch Jesus. Watch Jesus listening with such love in his eyes. Watch him smile and say, Mary, Watch her stop talking and look straight up into this man's face and watch the recognition dawn on her face and her eyes. My teacher, she cries and she grabs hold of Jesus and he laughs and he gently steps back. You don't need to hold on to me like this anymore, Mary. Mary, it's okay, just let go. Now, as you watch that scene unfold, again, what's happening inside of you? And watch Jesus look from Mary to you. And hear Jesus say your name. 
And then take whatever time you need to let the Holy Spirit unfold the rest of that conversation. And when you're ready, pray something like this. Lord Jesus, your name is precious to me. And I am longing to experience just how precious my name is to you. Please speak my name again and again. Speak it in love, speak it in comfort, speak it in hope, speak it in peace. Speak it so often that I come, I come to know you as you know me and help me to experience your presence. Help me to experience your presence always, especially in times like this. And now as you begin to draw your prayer to a close, listen again to the way that Jesus honors Mary by sending her to his brothers with the message of his coming ascension. Watch her excitement as she runs. I've seen the Lord. And now with Mary gone, it's just you and Jesus. Jesus looks at you and he smiles and he speaks. Take whatever time you need to listen and to respond. What's the next step that Jesus is asking you to take? What a comfort this is, isn't it? It's for real. It's good. I hope you experienced a bit of that. I hope you heard Jesus of the Father calling you by name in that meditation. This is what he's been up to. It's what our God's been up to all along. Seven centuries before Jesus, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah. And in the language of the old King James Version, he said, Comfort ye my people. Yeah. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. His people then were in distress, as we are now. And we have far more comfort to receive, even than they did, because we have Jesus. Yep. So we're going to encourage you to finish this worship service after you're done listening to us by listening to the musical version of this verse, made famous by Handel's Messiah. Uh, we posted a contemporary rendition of that, or you can find the original if you prefer. Either way, listen and recognize that today God speaks to you and me the same message. Comfort my people. Speak tenderly to my people. Tell them they can trust me. Yes. And so that's the prayer we pray for you. That's the blessing we pass along to you today. Be comforting. And be comforting. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen.